Hello everybody from the University of Oslo. It's a pleasure for me to greet all of you today. I am Nora Sveos. I am professor of psychology, as I mentioned, at the University of Oslo, Norway. I am member of the Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture. I've been a member there and for five years and a vice chair for two. And before this, I was eight years in the Committee Against Torture. So my background in this field is, uh, is, is on both with relation to, to UN, but also as a clinician. Because as a psychologist, I've been working for many years with victims of torture, mostly refugees seeking protection in Norway. I certainly would have wanted to join all of you uh, at this meeting in Sofia these, this week, but unfortunately, uh, I will be at the session at the, in Geneva for the Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture. So I certainly would have wanted to join you, but I hope that I can be able to participate on the later workshops. Because I think this project, working on national preventive mechanism standards, is something which is very relevant. And it's absolutely something that we also discuss in the, com in the committee itself and when on visits, discuss with the National Preventive Mechanism. So again, I'm looking forward to meet you all in a later situation. Um, I am aware that you will, will be discussing uh, methodology, visiting or NPM methodology when you're meeting now these days, and that you will be in particular focused on how to deal with uh, groups in vulnerable situations and how you can uh, develop both visit methodology and also follow up and recommendations with regard to these groups. So I will say some words about some of the observations I've done myself in my work as a visiting uh, member of the SPT. But before I go into any details on, on vulnerable groups or groups in vulnerable situations, I want to say some words about reprisals or other forms of negative reactions that persons that we collaborate with, either as an international body or as NPM after visits to places of detention, can be exposed to. So uh, reprisals is something that we in the SPT always speak to on all levels where we visit, on state level, on the institutional level, and of course also with the people who we are interviewing. And I know that the national preventive mechanisms perhaps have had uh, all over some different strategies as to how much they have focused on reprisals and also what kind of policy they have developed with, re with regards to reprisals. So this is a big issue, I think. And why I raise this issue now is because some of the groups that you will be discussing in your meeting, what we call persons in vulnerable situations, may be more likely to or more at risk of reprisals than others. Because one of the groups that come into my mind uh, firstly is, for instance, migrants, immigrants or migrants in detention. We know from visits that people uh, that are not nationals often have lack of support from their own consulate. There's often lack of services with regard to interpretations, something that means that those who are migrants often do not have their rights fulfilled. Their basic legal safeguards are often not respected. They don't have access to the kind of of legal support and also other forms of support that they should have. So sometimes if they tr try to complain or if any way protest against lack of, of support from the institutions, they may be um, also at risk of reprisals or other forms of negative sanctions. So this is the first point I'd like to raise with you. Another group that deserves our full attention when we visit is the LGBTI group. Uh, we should always be very in well informed about how the, the different prisons, and I'm speaking mostly now about prisons and police stations, how they organize uh, the care and the living conditions for people of, the, uh, of LGBTI persons. Are they together? Are they, separate? Are they separated into different uh, areas? Are, are trans persons, where are they placed? Are trans men placed among men or women, those issues are always very important to map before we start doing the visit. And in some places they may be with other persons, uh, gay men may be with other men, but they, they are not supposed to know about their 
uh, there being an LGBTI person. So these things are important to map so that we know how the conditions are, where we meet them, where can we find them, if they are interested in, interv in being interviewed. And of course, interviewing them fully in private, as we do with all interviews, is very, very crucial. And again, LGBTI persons are at risk of reprisals, and we must be very aware how we deal with the information that is based on them. Because we know that there are often very few in a prison, and then any recommendation that is based on information from them can be very easily uh, understood as being complaints from them, and again, they may be at risk. And another group also that we must be very focused on is persons with mental disabilities. And when I speak about mental disabilities, I speak both of persons who have intellectual disabilities and those who have psychosocial disabilities. That is a psychiatric diagnosis or any form of psychological or psychiatric illness related to, to their lives and their mental health. So we know that these people may sometimes be in special areas or sections of the, of the prison. Uh, we know that they may also be dispersed throughout. Uh, they may also be an issue whereas they should be in prison at all or whether they should actually be in hospital. So again, knowing how the institutions deal with persons with mental disabilities is a big, big issue. And again, know beforehand uh, where they are, how they're treated, and then to do the interviews and to see how this comes out in practice. And we know from numerous visits that, and also from reading uh, reports both from the uh, torture committee and re recommendations and as well as the reports from the SPT and, and the CPT that the follow-up and the health provision to persons with mental health dis uh, disabilities is something often very very prob problematic and very precarious. So this is uh, also a focus that we need to have at all times and, and in order to really know what is happening interviews are extremely important but more than that or in addition to that, go to the books, see the records, see the, the medical files, and see what kind of treatment they are provided with, including uh, medicine and other forms of support and treatment. Because maybe, may, many places, they may be some of those in the worst conditions in prisons. And of course, also among people in vulnerable situations are persons who have physical disabilities, uh, people who have problems with movement that are not being helped or, or provided with, uh, with care that, that in some way is suited to their disability. We can have people with, who, are, who are deaf or who are hard of hearing and, and blind. Again, uh, we must be sure that they have conditions in prisons that are in line or, can, or, op or are as, pos optimal, no, as optimal as possible to their specific condition. So again, uh, we need to look at uh, those kinds of disabilities, but also general people who are ill. And most places in the world, at least that I have visited, there is a lack of staff and the lack of medical care to persons also with, with regular uh, forms of illnesses. I don't know how much, how many people I've seen with very serious and non-treated infections after uh, unhygienic conditions, lack of water, and etc. So. All forms of medical care is a part of the vulnerability issue that we have to look at and come with recommendations with. Another group that we need to care about and need to question about are the juveniles, or even uh, if they may be above 18, the young, the young uh, inmates in prisons and also in, in police, uh, police detention. Uh, how are those, for instance, between 18 and 21 treated? There may be places, and I recently visited the place where people came in at 16, and, and um, between, how are those between 16 and 18 uh, treated in prison? Are they together with adults? Uh, even when they say that they are separated, are they in fact separated? What are the conditions? What are their possibilities to be in contact with, uh, with their family? What are the educational options, etc., etc. So juveniles are also um, represent a group that uh, I would say is in a very vulnerable situation, let alone those who are even younger than 16. They may be, be placed in specific institutions for, for minors with, um, in conflict with the law, 
and visiting those places and really looking closely into the conditions that they are receiving for rehabilitation and for uh, education and for possibilities to live a life without such a conflict is really of major importance to all of us. I have not at this point spoken so much about gender except for the LGBTI issues, but of course um, when we visit prisons and visit prisons that are specifically for women, we also need to, to look into what happens to, to women that are pregnant, that are being arrested and have to serve in, in the prison, what are their conditions uh, for health care with regard to this. Is there a special doctor in, in, the, in the institution that knows about and has a spe specific background for doing this kind of health care? And then, of course, when they, when they give birth, are they allowed to be with their babies? Are they let out? What happens? Again, these are persons in a very vulnerable situation, and we need to both know how, how is the care for these people uh, provided, and again, look at the books to see the situation that they are in. Finally, I, I want to, to mention those who are, uh, because of their behavior or because of conflicts in the centers of detention, placed in isolation or in disciplinary cells or in any form of disciplinary regime. Again, these are persons who are uh, in a very vulnerable situation. They may be left to isolation longer than the law or Mandela rules uh, provides. They may have also conditions in the cells that, may, that are extremely worse per, uh, even than, than some of the regular cells. They may be in disciplinary uh, disciplinary regime and we can ask how is the complaint procedure, how is the procedure by which any decision is taken with regards to disciplinary action, and all of these things are highly relevant for us to speak about. Because when we interview persons, either they are placed in isolation either for their own protection or, or as a part of a disciplinary action or any other decision on the part of the institution, we may often meet people who are very vulnerable and whose rights are often not respected in the way they should. So, having said some of these uh, some comments about different groups that I see are in, in a more specifically vulnerable situation than others. I hope to have encouraged uh, all of us for the discussion that we need to have to define and amplify and go deeper into both methods of interviewing, of uh, searching for uh, information in the system that in some way can support what we hear from the interviews, and also what kind of uh, recommendations and follow-up procedures we should have to ensure that matters that we have observed as problematic can be dealt with in the aftermath. So I wish you all a very fine uh, meeting, and again, look forward to see you again next year. All the best from me. Bye-bye.